Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here and I'm back with a new Blu-ray review video. And today I'm reviewing Virus and Lawnmower Man. Now these are the new releases by Scream Factory or Shout Factory. Um, I'm a bit late with these, I do apologize because uh, I had to wait quite a while for Lawnmower Man to come out. Virus turned up and I thought, oh, well, I'll wait till Lawnmower Man then I'll just do both of them in one video. But we'll kick it off with Virus first. And now Virus I saw back in late 1999. Um, I must have rented it with some friends. Um, I was old enough then to rent 18 rated movies. Um, and you know the premise of the movie looked really cool. That this you know, alien virus that kind of infected this Russian military ship takes over and kills everyone on board apart from one individual who basically is Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Sutherland discovers later on. Um, and especially spill the beans on what's happened and beforehand all these people on the ship were basically transformed into these kind of slash humanoid slash robots it's basically like the terminator meets the thing you know kind of a bit like that um so you've got a lot of very grotesque scenes um you know for you know for a horror movie it does exactly what it says on the tin um but me and my friends thought the movie was pretty crap to be honest i mean it didn't get received very well when it came out and it bombed pretty much um I didn't see the movie until recently because I kind of, you know, just wrote it off for a number of years. It may have been on TV a few times, I was just flicking through the channels, but I just wasn't interested. Actually, the one thing that I did like about the movie a few, from a few years ago was the soundtrack by um, Joel McNeely. He did uh, work on like, Soldier with um, Kurt Russell and he works on Family Guy mostly. And um, yeah, the score was, I thought was wonderful. I had like a bunch of tracks. I thought, right, I've got to get this soundtrack. And it works extremely well in the movie uh, upon revisiting it. And seeing it on Blu-ray, finally, you know, in high definition, it was wonderful to look at. I mean, John Bruno, the director, who was a visual effects guy, he you know, worked on Ghostbusters. He worked with James Cameron on T2, like Titanic, and more under and on more recent films, such as The Kingsman and the Twilight movies. And this was his directorial debut. And you know, handling an eighty million dollar production uh, with all these in-camera practical effects, CGI as well, and trying to tell a story that kind of made sense uh, must have been a huge challenge. You know, because I think any for any director, their first movie being this huge kind of sci-fi kind of slash horror movie would have been a challenge. And you know, seeing it in high definition, cinema scope finally, because seeing it in pan and scan before. Uh, this just looked incredible, you know, uh, the, the photography was great, John Bruno makes a great use of the Cinemascope format, there's great kind of framing and stuff, but still the, the, the story, you know, is not particularly brilliant, you know, it's based on a sort of Dark Horse comic series that's, that did very well, so many kind of studios were like, right, let's kind of jump on this kind of comic book movie. During the 90s, comic book movies were kind of very, you know, up and down in quality, and by the late 90s, you know, so many films were just bombing and just being utter disasters. You know, Warner Brothers were pumping out loads of movies that was kind of failing, you know, falling by the wayside, and uh, Universal, you know, with this one. Now, this movie was screen tested and uh, did extremely well with, with the feedback, and the studio executives were very happy with the movie. It was supposed to be released in August of 1998, um, which is apparently like the hurricane season in America, so it kind of had the, you know, you had this natural disaster going on in your own town or something then you go see a movie about this kind of you know this uh, disastrous kind of you know uh, sea voyage kind of movie and for whatever reason it was pushed back to january of 1999 now january as most people know is kind of a dumping ground for studios and this big budget movie just got dumped right in the middle of january in the usa now during the course of 1999 it got released during the kind of coming months as, as you know as it gets hotter and hotter and then i think by the summer it was released in some cinema so it kind of hit at the right time in some territories but in the usa where it was supposed to work then and it was january so now with the blu-ray itself it comes with an audio commentary by john bruno and writer dennis feldman now dennis feldman is interviewed on this as well as a separate feature but also wrote Species, um, which I will be reviewing uh, on the next episode. Also, it comes with an interview with John Bruno discussing how he got involved in the movie and the scripting process and going to shoot it and how they rented that kind of military ship for like literally one dollar mentally. Eh? It's got also it's got an interview with actor Marshall Bell. He now he's plays a sort of wimpy kind of character in the movie. Um, he's also in uh, Total Recall. Um, and also such a troopers. He always gets killed in movies. He's always employed to be a complete nutcase and just gets killed, but he's a 
fantastic actor. Now the best special feature with this Blu-ray is the visual effects documentary. It's probably about 30 minutes long and all the other ones with the interviews with the director and writer about 20 minutes. Um, this has interviews with Steve Johnson, obviously he worked on Ghostbusters and loads of you know, loads of films with like big makeup effects and things like that. Uh, Eric Ollard who specialised in like, robotics so he, you know, he worked on things like Short Circuit. So when you see this movie, you know, the, it, it, it is basically a big showreel for all these visual effects guys. You've got a visual effects guy directing it, you've got amazing team behind the scenes kind of cre creating all these giant robots and stuff and all these kind of body horror. Um, so yeah, I mean, the story is not particularly, you know, that interesting. I think that's probably why it's kind of not really being received well over the years and it's kind of has a niche kind of fan base. The feature itself is really detailed. There are lots of interviews with other members of the team showing you what they did and the, and the design process. So, you know, if you're, you know, big into sort of, you know, uh, special effects and makeup stuff, I think this would be probably the most interesting part of the whole set for you. Also got the original featurette on the movie, which was, um, I think you can probably get it on YouTube. I think I think it is there. Uh, it was one of those kind of, you know, 30 minute making ofs they did back then, mostly kind of consisting of interviews. And usually with those things, and the H I remember the old HBO ones you get on, you know, on discs and stuff. It's just all the actors, you know, slapping their backs going, yeah, this film's amazing. And they won't admit that the movie's terrible. Uh, also with Jamie Lee Curtis and how she got involved. Now, originally they were thinking Linda Hamilton for the part, and it was produced by Gail Ann Heard, this movie. John Bruno obviously worked with uh, Linda before on the Terminator movies, and but they went with Jamie Lee Curtis, who was apparently really popular in Europe. So now these choices and who they cast is very much relies on who's popular in which territory. Um, so Jamie Lee Curtis, well, I think, was a good choice. I think she's always, you know, she's she is the scream queen, as they call it. You know, always screaming in Halloween or any other horror movies she's been in. But later on, I think Jamie Lee Curtis basically admitted that she didn't like the movie and said it was a pile of shit, basically. Not, I don't think that those terms, but I th she's not particularly kind on it. And now in terms of picture quality, and now the Blu-ray does look pretty good. Um, I have no problems with it. Um, the sound is really nice. Obviously, you know, it's doing the late 90s, 5.1 soundtracks are, you know, pretty much the norm. Um, it sounds great in the system. In terms of, like, um, you know, the quality of the movie, in terms of recommending it for you guys, um, I don't know, I, I, it starts out well. I like the premise, as I said earlier, you know, this kind of thing taking over the ship. And its its ultimate goal, I suppose, is quite interesting. But I think the characters are very two-dimensional. I, I I feel that the story isn't that engaging. And I think I'm halfway through it, I was kind of like mm, looking at my phone, just like pissing around, going, oh, you know. But um, I think I think the ending's quite cool. And when you see the, you know, the the main monster, as it were, the sort of who's been controlling everything, he, and that's basically our last stand against Jamie Lee Curtis. Um, and you see this kind of practical, massive monster, like within camera, and then when it starts moving stuff, it's all like CG, but the CG is phenomenal, it still looks great to this day. Now, there's so many movies in the 90s where the CG, you can tell it's CGI, you can tell they've gone too far with, they're being far too ambitious, basically, they're basically abusing the technology. And you think they could have done that practically, but they're just gone CG. Uh, there's a few exceptions in the 90s where CG was kind of used like way over the top, but still looks great to this day. And that's Starship Troopers. But Virus kind of fits within that little category. I think it's, it fits there nicely. I think this still looks really good. So I think for like a Saturday night movie with a bunch of friends or just, you know, with your partner, um, it would be quite good fun or maybe it's something you can watch at Halloween maybe um, but don't watch it while you're eating your dinner you know you, you're watching it, the, the gore and stuff doesn't kick in like halfway in but you know if you sort of you put it on and you pause it get a pizza then you start eating it then all these people getting torn apart and all these bits body parts everywhere you'd be like well right, I'm off my dinner fuck this um, but yeah so I, I think I think it's definitely worth a purchase just for like the interviews and stuff and hearing about John Bruno's kind of you know how he made the movie and he's such a humble guy and I feel sorry for him that he didn't really direct any other movies later on because this movie bombed and he went back into doing visual effects and it's a shame because he's he's you know he's got a good visual eye he can you know he can direct actors you know tell a story it's just the story itself is not that interesting apart from the sort of the idea of itself everything else is kind of a little bit predictable and stuff so um, it's not a super duper movie, but it's something I probably would cover in future as a retrospective. Um, so, 
maybe Halloween, like the October month. I still haven't compiled my list yet of what I want to do. There's a couple of movies on my list and think, right, I'm going to do that, do that, and that. But uh, Virus is kind of like was on the list and it wasn't, so I may I may just kind of review it as just, just as a separate thing later on and not have it part as Halloween uh, special. But anyway, let's crack on with Lawnmower Man. Now, Lawnmower Man. Um, now this movie came out in 1992, I believe. Uh, yes, it was. <laughs> uh, I saw this. Uh, I think it was Sky Movies. I think my friend uh, John, you know, he as I taped it or something like that, and it's one of those, you know, Sky Movie premieres. So it would have been like 1993. I probably was seeing it. Um, and it was, you know, it was a movie that everyone kind of wanted to see, uh, in, especially you know my age because of all the virtual reality stuff. But I think maybe like a year or two later, you know, after it came out on VHS and stuff, um, the sort of bubble had burst on the VR interest because the technology just wasn't good enough. Um, it's like, we knew, I, I've had a go with it before. It's like these massive headsets. Like, and then the, the quality of the graphics is like watching, I don't know, a bit like an Atari Jaguar game. It just doesn't look good. And it always just gave you headaches and the frame rate was shit. And so, yeah, it wasn't particularly good. It wasn't like anything you saw in the film. The film was completely just like different to what you'd actually experience on, with VR. Now, because the film is based on a short story, was supposed to be based on a short story by Stephen King, because uh, originally it was supposed to be an anthology movie, a bunch of Stephen King stories all compiled into one movie. And Law Man was one of them. Um, but that obviously never came to be. So come late, I think it was maybe late, late 80s or early 90s, they got Brett Leonard involved. And now Brett had... Um, I think done a short movie, I think, or maybe a kind of another uh, like a feature film, but very small scale. And this was his kind of big stepping stone into the industry. And he didn't want to do a horror film. He wanted to do like a sci-fi kind of like, um, yeah, it's like a sci-fi technology movie. And he kind of t changed the script a lot and expanded upon most of what was in the story. The original story was this kind of like this psychotic guy with a lawnmower. I think he cut people up and, and used their remains as fertilizer or something like that. Um, in the film though there is like a little moment of like from the original book where I think the lawnmower goes into Spoke's apartment and it kills him that was it that was the only component of like you know Stephen King's story now with the extra features you get the director's cut as well presented in widescreen like before I only seen it in pan and scan because it was shown on TV and it was released on Laserdisc um, so it was good seeing this kind of new kind of transfer of the director's cut and the theatrical cut. Now, the, Brett, the director, said you know he prefers the unrated director's cut over the theatrical cut, which was kind of his longer version was cut down by New Line because I wanted it to be more of a special effects kind of movie, and I kind of trimmed out a lot about Jeff Fahey's character and how much you can sort of sympathise with him more in the extended version. But I don't know. I I, I think I prefer the theatrical cut. I think it's a bit more quicker with its storytelling and gets to its points far quicker it kind of um, doesn't feel so baggy where the director's cut there's some interesting stuff in it but I think it really feels like a TV movie in some parts it doesn't really feel like you're watching a theatrical feature film um, it sort of it spends too long with these kind of these characters and doesn't get and doesn't get moving along quick enough because um, most of the director's cut I think most of it's kind of the beginning of the movie is really just like extended I think maybe like 40 minutes maybe uh, put back in. Law Merman hasn't really been given a decent Blu-ray release you know throughout Europe or America before. I mean there was one in I think maybe Spain but the picture quality is rubbish um, and this one thankfully looks great it looks really good so if you're a big fan of Law Merman you'll love this Blu-ray and the uh, new sound mix which has a 5.1 surround sound. It sounded really quiet I didn't think it was very good uh, the new mix it's I don't know it sounds like it was kind of like a fake 5.1 like a st from stereo to 5.1 uh, so I just kind of stuck with the stereo mix which sounded a bit more fuller and a bit more louder but there, was, but there wasn't much action in in the rear channels now the one thing that's kind of stopped me from reviewing this movie um, in my usual retrospective way was um, the soundtrack it never got released um, which is strange because the movie did pretty well at the box office which is why we got a sequel a few years later which <laughs> bombed um, but yeah, I was surprised. I could never find a soundtrack. It was never got official release. And how I do my reviews, I like to incorporate that and create the trailers and have, things, have music in the background when I'm talking. And so I thought, well, you know, I just kind of wait for the Blu-ray and have a discussion about it then. I mean, I think the movie's okay. I mean, it's not a brilliant film. I think there's it's great production values for its budget. 
the CGI was, um, you know, pretty impressive for the time. They, they, they didn't have ILM or boss films involved. They, uh, Brett Leonard knew a lot of guys on, you know, worked at Silicon Valley, you know, guys who worked with computers and these kind of software houses kind of just developed the visual effects for him with a very tight budget. And, you know, what you had one company doing all the sort of, you know, the operating system graphics and one doing the sort of VR stuff and one doing the kind of moments where you see people kind of like turn to like bubbles and just disappear and disintegrate. That was pretty impressive visual effect for the time. Also the moment where they get attacked by loads of bees. Um, that that does look pretty bad today. Um, I like the moments we see Jeff Hagen's his kind of golden head. He's kind of looking at the guys. That 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 does look pretty cool. Um, but at the end, you know, when you see him kind of get into the system and he becomes this kind of, you know, lawnmower man character, as it were, you know, you see his face talking. It just looks so weird and everyone, like, moves like this. Uh, uh, and they point and stuff. It's all really animated and a bit... It's not, it's not particularly smooth, you know, with the movements. Um, it's funny. It's funny seeing it because it does look very dated. And it's, it's, it's interesting in the documentary, the, the, um, I think maybe the producer or the visual effects guy says, like, the effects were kind of rendered in NTSC and signal, so when they exported it, it must be onto like a high resolution tape, and then it was put on film. They had to, you know, do a lot of work with it to make it look good on 35 millimeter. So it's not like high definition footage they kind of had to use. It was, you know, once you see it, you know, on in Blu-ray, it kind of seems to work quite well with balance matching the live action with the computer generated imagery where not in terms of like seamless quality but in terms of like it doesn't look like you're watching videotape footage it looks like it does look high res in some regards and obviously with these you know with this blu-ray you get new interviews with the director visual effects guys uh, producer you get like um jeff fahey's involved as well but there's no pierce i'm, I'm afraid um which is a shame pierce was apparently going through a lot of um problems at the time i think he i think his wife had just passed away but you know he, he did a good job with the with the performance. You know having this kind of you know really disastrous thing happening happening in his life, then having to work on this kind of movie and, and still remain professional and not you know come across as very depressed. He did, did a wonderful job with it. Lawnmower Man, like Virus, has a very kind of niche market. I think it still has it. It still has its following, but I don't I don't think um, many people really consider it a, a decent film. I think it's very much a, a movie of its time and a sort of part of that VR boom. And some of my friends, you know, once they saw I bought this Blu-ray, they were just like, oh, this, this is shit, this film, you know? And I was like, oh, no, no, it's still got a lot of charm to it. It's, it's not good stuff in it still, but it's just kind of hindered by this kind of this mad premise. Um, it's interesting that they never, in the documentary, they never mention Stephen King. They're just they're mentioned by, oh, the author of Lawnmower Man, um, because of legal problems, because it had, Stephen King was annoyed that that they'd put his name on this movie where it had nothing to do with his original story. I think he I think he possibly had sued them and got his name and moved off it. So you do you see there's no if you can get hold of like a original teaser poster one sheet that we have Steve you know, based on Stephen King's short story or something. I think yeah, I think there's I think there's early T V spots as well that have Stephen King's name on it, but but on this, you know, Blu-ray, there's no mention of uh, Stephen King by name. So it's it's it is they it is when you do watch the documentary, it's a little bit like, mm, you know, try not to say his name. Um, but I think out of the two, I think Lawnmower Man is definitely one I would recommend. I think the, the the interview, the making of itself is about 50 minutes long, so it's really informative. And Brett Leonard, you know, went on to direct Vir Virtuosity, and, and sadly, the, you know, the, the shittest Highlander movie ever. Um, you know, he's still involved in the sort of VR kind of industry. I think he's still, you know, um, He's still involved in, in large capacity, so I think he's kind of moved away from making films to that, um, which is great. You know, this one guy who made this virtual reality kind of movie back in the nineties has become this kind of you know spokesperson for the technology. Um, but yeah, he's an interesting character, but also in typical Shout Factory fashion, you know, you get the slipcase obviously with the film, and you get original posters. So you can kind of reverse the cover. You can't do that with Virus. It just has this kind of weird black and white photo on the back. But I was never a fan of the uh, theatrical poster. All sort of looked a bit wank. <laughs> so um, yeah, it just seemed a bit weird to me. But the new, the new, the new artwork there is really, really good. I like, I do like that. Um, I think people who could pre-order get a free poster, but 
I don't get posters <laughs> from Shout Factory. Um, but out of the two, definitely Lawnmower Man I'd recommend. But if you've got the money, buy both. You know, they're not that expensive. But, um, you know, if these are Region A Blu-rays. I always forget to say this, you know, but I always tend to think people are generally aware of this. Most Blu-rays are region free, so you can play it in your player and it works fine where, wherever you live. But, you know, labels such as Arrow, uh, Shout Factory, they're all region locked to their country. So this is region A, so you need a multi-region player if you live outside the USA. So if you're going to want to play this outside the USA, you're going to need a region modded player. Uh, some, some you can do that with a remote hack, you know, put like a engineer's code and you can change the region or you have to pay a professional to sort of put a chip in and do that so so beware so but they're, they're not that expensive these um these discs you can get it from shout factory if you live in the usa or if you live in outside and try amazon or importcds.com um but the next ones i'm going to be reviewing is uh, species and teen wolf uh so there's a new version of teen wolf coming out very soon so expect that probably late september i think that review if teen wolf turns up in august and um, I'll cover it then. Well, that's the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be back with some more videos very soon. Okay, take care and goodbye. If you enjoyed the video, you can find more on my YouTube channel. And also you can follow me on Twitter. If you want to help support the channel, you can donate through Patreon and receive monthly perks such as updates on the latest news on my channel, early access to reviews and commentaries before they go live on YouTube. Even the smallest donation can help keep this channel going. Thank you.